Google has finally fired back at OpenAI with their latest large language model, Gemini. And this is arguably the world's most ambitious AI project ever. And that's why it warrants a video, some introspection, some analysis, and some personal thoughts. Let's do it. So we're gonna be doing a lot of comparing it to GPT-4 because it's just clear that's used by more people. That's the one that is the king of the hill right now. But comparing what Google and Microsoft have, Google has some advantages. And one of those is a massive data set. So not taking anything away from Microsoft who has an entire social network in LinkedIn. They do have an entire copy of the internet that they have indexed for their Bing search engine. So they're in a good spot. But that is not the same as having Google's user base, the information about what people have searched, also owning the second largest search engine in the world, YouTube. Think about Gmail and all of the other Google projects that people build on top of and the data that they give to them. All of that is going into this large language model. From the data point of view, I would say Google has something even more impressive than Microsoft to work with. But of course, having a bunch of knowledge and learning that knowledge is a different story. So now let's look at the learning side. So thanks to this chart from Life Architect who actually went out and looked at all the white papers and compiled this data into a spreadsheet sheet, you can see how much more time it spent in school learning about that data than ChatGPT or GPT-4 that powers it. Notice how many years of training Gemini went through. 15,616 compared to the 6,000 507 years that GPT went through. So these two numbers I think are the most expressive. The chip size going from 25,000 chips which is what GPT-4 was trained on to 57,000 more than doubling. And then on top of it, not only having a bigger chip set of learning, there's also a whole lot more learning years that went into this system. So years being a way to measure computation in terms of how many cycles it's going throughout 365 days. But there was 6,507 years for GPT-4 and a whopping almost three times that 15,616 years for the new Gemini model. That's like having a kid with twice as big of a head in school for about three times as long. Should be quite a bit smarter. But now let's talk about OpenAI and their talent versus Google's DeepMind, Google Brain, and their talent. Microsoft had some great AI researchers. They worked a little bit with OpenAI, but really Sam Altman is the one that brought in a lot of the people with Elon Musk actually in the early times. But all of that together isn't really even on the same level as DeepMind and Google Brain. Like Google has been the king of the hill. They have brought all of the world's best talent together for decades. And after the success of GPT-4 put Google on high alert, the CEO, Sundar Pichai, went to all of the different divisions that were off doing different types of research and said, hey, we need to get unified. We need to compete with OpenAI. And here's the data. Here's the funding. You can even expand your team from here, but we need you all to refocus. So these guys building Gemini, they're not the underdogs. In essence, they're the ones that I've should be at the AI king of the hill, and they're about to try to reclaim that. Would be the most beneficial and consequential technology for humanity. Human beings in our society would have five senses, and the world we built and the media we consume is in those uh, different modalities. So I'm super proud and excited to announce the launch of the Gemini era. Okay, so let's talk about what the results were. Let's do some testing. Gemini is surpassing models like ChatGPT by achieving higher scores in many key academic benchmarks, including the famous MMLU. That's a really good benchmark for how smart systems like this are. It's called the Massive Multitask Language and Understanding Test. And it tests AI systems like ChatGPT across 50 different fields. So it's very broad. It understands all sorts of different ways that we think about knowledge and education. And because Google's Gemini scored higher on this, it kind of in a sense means that Gemini is a better for all basic practical applications across many different domains, science, history, medicine, poetry, etc. It's the jack of all trades test. And then another aspect of this model that really does set it apart from the way that GPT-4 works is that it's what they call multimodal. It's Gemini's ability to integrate both visual and textual information in the same input that really sets it apart. Of course, ChatGPT, you can upload images, it can use the vision API, and then it can also convert audio to Word. So it's multimodal in a sense where you can actually just convert things to text, but it's really a text-based 
nice token model at the end of the day. But Gemini being like truly multimodal, like the way our human brain is tied in directly with our visual system and our hearing, it's just a, it's a much more tightly integrated sort of thing, which makes it find certain patterns or come up with certain solutions that just GPT-4 wouldn't have. Now, of course, all this buzz has got Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, once fired, then rehired again, talking a little bit about GPT-5, which is unreleased now and pretty speculative. But thanks to the Life Architect chart, you can see how fascinating this was. Like since GPT-3 really came out and people started using these large language models, at that point, we're talking about only 10,000 chips being trained for about 15 clock days, 405 years. A few things come out for Meta that are smaller, and then the whopping GPT-4 just blows that out of the water with 6,507 years of training. And here comes Gemini, I, you might as well say blowing it out of the water, but since we're going up on this exponential growth kick, it's pretty fascinating to see that it's like three times longer being trained and it's twice as many chips and then GPT-5 is hot on its heels with kind of a similar training run actually less chips overall but of course like the TPU4 the tensor processing unit that Google makes versus the Nvidia H100s like I don't know how to compare those two exactly but it looks like it's less chips and just a little bit more years so they should be kind of comparable and if GPT-5 scores a lot higher on tests like the MMLU, it's gonna mean that they have just something else going on over at OpenAI. They have some sort of other understanding about how to train these models that make them better than what Google has figured out. Okay, so Dr. Alan D. Thompson actually links to this chart. So if you want to pull it up, there's a link in the description below and you can actually come copy over this spreadsheet and you can see there's some other really interesting data that's been compiled on this uh, completely open shareable spreadsheet. So check it out. But now I'll dive into a little bit more to the benchmarks. Um, here's the MMLU scoring, you know, not significantly high. I mean, that probably is like technically significant in statistics terms, but going from 86 to 90 is, is smarter. Generally, overall, it's smarter. Um, but when you break it down into reasoning, mathematics, and coding, you can see a little bit more of where the kind of nuanced is that makes Gemini better and in one case worse. It reasons almost the same. It's got this drop test, which is reading comprehension, meaning it should be understanding text that you give it better. I would say like summarizing is something it might be stronger at. And then it gives up on common sense reasoning and doesn't compete in the same way that GPT-4 does. So imagine being able to comprehend something better than someone else, but you can't reason about it. Like I would argue that the reasoning about it is more important than the comprehension in the first place. So I gotta give it to GPT-4 on this, even though it wasn't trained as well. And then, I don't know, there's kind of like moderate improvements in math. I mean, certainly 2.4% is, is not nothing, but I don't know, it didn't just like get way better at a lot of things. Math, it, it did kind of shine. Um, with coding, it kind of shined, but it kind of didn't in this test. So when it came to Python code generation, it wasn't as good. In this test, Python code generation in this test, it was, I don't know. So I think they're pretty comparable. Um, I've personally been playing with them both a little bit and I there is something nice about Gemini. I do feel maybe like it's, a little bit better, but I'm also super familiar with GPT-4 and I love the way that it can like just quickly jump into Dolly and generate images sometimes. And I also feel more constrained though in GPT-4. Like you can tell there's been much more um, RLHF feedback, meaning these humans are reinforcing good behavior and it's becoming more sort of PC and controlled and predictable. Whereas with um, Gemini, I'm getting the sense that I'm like talking to somebody who kind of has their own thoughts and sort of a little bit more of their own worldview. We need to think about these tools as products. They're not just models that are just open sourced and everybody does their own thing with them. Both Google Gemini and ChatGPT powered by GPT-4, they're, they're websites and apps that people go to and they specifically interact with in the way you would interact with a human assistant. But one of the real super amazing things that seems like people at Facebook are never gonna figure out in the same way that OpenAI has is how to deliver product. I mean, give Sam Altman credit. Like he came from the startup world and he was disruptive, got it done. And GPT-4, you just log into it and use it and it keeps getting upgraded and it's just super useful and it's pretty darn reliable. But you compare that to Google, like they're no slouches either. Like what they've done with Maps and Google Assistant and over the years with their office suite, it's just all been incredibly well executed. And there's certainly some extremely talented people that do product over there too. So Gemini has real potential. And I will say 
they already have a user base. So as big as ChatGPT is right now, with potentially around 180 million people that have signed up for it and the fastest growing app of all time, that's nothing compared to the 1.8 billion Gmail users that already have Google accounts and can simply click on a tab with the same login and now be playing with Gemini. And actually there's probably even more accounts than that, but since Gmail is like a pretty good proxy, I think that we should be thinking about 2 billion people who just kind of got access to Gemini. And if they start just pushing that a little bit inside of their product, like you log into your Gmail and it's like, hey, play with the new Gemini. You go in to make like a Google Doc and it's like, hey, use Gemini to like help fix this thing. It's only 20 bucks a month or whatever. And people just start getting familiar with the different ways they could integrate it into other products or go to the standalone page. Like, whoa, they might actually do that kind of Apple model, like come into the game late, but come in strong and make it just kind of integrated in a way that makes it more useful. I think there's a billion Android devices too, which they all pretty much have Gmail accounts. So like, they're already on more phones also. Like everybody had to go to their Apple or Android device and download GPT, but like they could probably push this out. Yeah, in some more integrated way into to the actual phone operating system. And I know GPT-4 is being integrated into Windows. It's being integrated into Bing. So maybe there's something there. I don't want to downplay it. This is why it's a very interesting comparison, but they just, they just don't seem like Google to me in the way that they build products. So all in all, I have some really high hopes for Gemini. I see Google's incredible data source. I see the talent that they have from DeepMind, from Google Brain coming together. I see that custom TPU hardware. I didn't really talk about all of that, but they've been designing their own Tensor hardware. They built TensorFlow, their own operating systems for artificial intelligence training. And over the years, Gemini didn't just have to be built from nowhere. It was built on top of a history of stepping stones. So they had the Lambda model and the Palm models, which were breaking records in all sorts of interesting multimodal ways that this was built on top of, or built sort of in, uh, memory of, I guess you would say. Like they took all of that and kind of retrained it in the same way. So they're not starting from scratch. But you know, it's just that the experience when the rubber hits the road sometimes is so different from what the model can do when tested. Like it has to be something that people like me just sign up and use and it makes our life better. So there's just so many more hurdles than the technology itself to making that useful. And in a lot of cases, like something with less capabilities is just more convenient and more useful. It just wins out. Like how many times do we take photos with our phone because it's just on us versus like a big DSLR that might like look better, but you have to, you know, focus it and get the right lens and lug it around. You just, it's just not there all the time. So it doesn't become the primary way that we take photos. All right, and I'm sure by now you've caught the news. Gemini 1.5 release was a really impressive upgrade. And this newest version of Gemini includes an insane context window. Like I remember back in the GPT-4 early days when it was like 28,000 tokens and then Claude came around and then we had the GPT-4 upgraded turbo. Even where the top of the line was before this model, 200,000 tokens just got blown out of the water. Books, scientific papers, like huge blogs, like a corpus of text, like that's amazing. Like entire podcast transcripts, every word. And of course this was all built with a, a different architecture than GPT-4. It's using what's called an MOE, a MO, which is a mixture of experts architecture. And that allows it to hunt through all of that data and be much more selective and efficient with its neural network about what it's choosing to pay attention to. And the fact that it's multimodal means you can put in an entire YouTube video in a way that isn't just a transcript, like feed in the raw video, link the audio files, boom, Gemini 1.5 can handle it. Complex code base with folders on folders on folders, like linking to other dependencies, just throw it in there. So they're definitely cooking up some really interesting advancements over at Google, and I'm sure this is just the tip of the iceberg. But I've always had a couple worldviews that kind of oscillate back and forth, like, is this gonna be with AI, the first mover advantage is incremental, then bigger and bigger and bigger until it's such a big lead that nobody else can even get close to it? Or is this a world where lots of different AIs sort of branch out in all these little unique niches and it becomes more like a ecosystem of, of the world where just different AIs are just good at different things and use different computations for different purposes and it just all meshes into something different, like a society of AI or is it like super godlike AI? And if we take that version where it's just kind of like a godlike one and it comes down to what OpenAI is building and what Google is building, it seems to me like Google actually would be a step ahead. Maybe they could utilize a lot of the other stuff that Gemini sits on top of 
to kind of boost up a little bit more than OpenAI will be able to do. But with Microsoft backing them being such a reasonable competitor, but not the leader, and their kind of independent spirit, their ability to sort of maneuver quickly and maybe not be bogged down the same way as Google, that might give them the advantage. So it's like, it's very hard for me to predict. I mean, this one's multimodal, but Sam Altman's saying their next one will be multimodal too. So I'm sure they're like figuring that out, but I'm sure everyone at DeepMind is like, look, we have built AlphaFold. We have all of these crazy things that we've done. Like let's integrate all of that and see what happens when it all comes together. And maybe that will give next versions of Gemini this sort of really interesting emergent ability. So it's not exactly a copycat, but everybody's smart enough to know what everybody else is doing. And it's kind of about who gets it done quicker and who's got like better rails for integrating it into the, the real world where people are using it. But I definitely see maybe a future version of both of these systems being helpful in these real world ways that seems like Google would be better at. Like I imagine going to Gmail and Gemini helps me like write better emails or it, it writes emails on my behalf and sends them out and replies and maybe takes care of my taxes and stuff and communicates with people and it just does it. And if I wanted to use ChatGPT with that, I feel like it would just be kind of more friction. If I want a calendar to just optimize my life and it knows what I'm saying and what I'm doing and can maximize like my routes each day for getting errands done and stuff like that, then Gmail is gonna just plug in way better. I mean, there's more Androids than iPhones out there. So if it's all just about actually talking to your phone and saying like, bring me this app or map me to a direction or bring up the calculator and calculate this thing, it seems like Gemini is gonna have the advantage there too. At some point I see the multimodal aspect being video and if it was about generating visuals, like especially video on the fly, they have YouTube. So I don't even know when ChatGPT can do that kind of thing if I would just go there to like be entertained by video in the same way that I might when it's fully integrated into YouTube. And then if you do take this world model where it's kind of like leader takes all, the, the last thing that you have to think about is that it's either GPT whatever, seven, eight or nine or something, replacing Sam Altman as the CEO, or it's Gemini version whatever, seven, eight, nine, replacing Sundar Pichai as the CEO, making all the decisions, spinning up different like agents or just different instances of itself to solve problems and sort of slowly removing all of the employees that Google and Microsoft and OpenAI have and replacing them with these superhuman 24 hour agents. It's, that's crazy to think about, but it seems like Google might be the first one to like replace their CEO in a way where they become like superhuman as a company. You know, like I'm just not sure how Microsoft's gonna get into the same smart home, VR, healthcare, stuff in the same way or as fat. Well, they have the Xbox too. I forget, Microsoft is so, so gigantic, but I don't know, I just feel, maybe they could. And then they have their Epic game investment now too. So man, this is, a, these are two like warriors going at it. And maybe there's someone out there that compete with these two, but they would have to be like country governments or uh, maybe mega tech companies in China that I'm not, I'm not as aware of, but they're pushing the boundaries in some ways that seems comparable and have a bigger user base or whatever. But I will say after playing with Gemini, it is a decent competitor to chat GPT. It is something I'm gonna be using in my everyday workflow, which I didn't know if I would actually think it was that good, but it is. So thanks to Rob, $100 a month Patreon. You the man. Thanks for helping me keep these videos up and running. If you guys wouldn't mind hitting that subscribe button right now, that would help me get to 10,000 subscribers, my next goal. Thanks for watching.